this was a, a, a man called Martin Lukasi. He was Jewish, and he was working in Germany as the war started. And he was a fashion photographer and the first photographer to capture motion. Right. Before that time, everything was set. You stand there, you stand there, I'll photograph you. He was able to use a camera and the technology had advanced for him to show motion. Mm -hmm. And Cartier-Bresson, who you probably all heard of, is considered the greatest photographer of the 20th century. He was a painter. And when he saw this picture in a magazine, he threw his paint brushes away and said, I cannot paint that kind of spontaneity. So he became a photographer and then went on to become the great photographer of the 20th century. And that's the picture that made him do it. So that's a double reason why we consider that to be important. That was in 1930. And he fled Germany, came to America, and then started doing fashion and sports photography. This photograph here by this woman, she was an unknown photographer until about six months ago. Somebody was cleaning out a garage in Chicago, and they found hundreds and hundreds of cases, uh, cardboard boxes, with thousands and thousands of photographs. And somebody said, Gee, some of these are pretty good. So two dealers in New York bought the whole thing from the guy who owned the garage, because they were abandoned. Mm -hmm. And now what these two guys in New York, one's uh, Howard Greenberg and another one, uh, whose name I skipped, they are resurrecting, creating or creating. See, this, mm -hmm. this is a photographer who we missed. Who is went she's still alive? No, she's dead. She's dead. No children, no nothing. This was a serious depression. Yeah, People didn't get mad. They were just proud to be Americans. And, and what they did is this organization, which was a government organization, it hired the best photographers in America. And it sent them out without any, they said, photograph America, but photograph the pride of being an American in difficult times. So they went out, and these four or five phot photographers, and they now went on to become like Dorothy Lange, this is Dorothy Lange, that's Dorothy Lange, this is Walker Evans, and this is Dorothy Lange. So these three are Dorothy Lange, that's Walker Evans. They are two of probably the most important five photographers working in America since the turn of the century. And why I made this photograph, the American iconic photograph, is, is technically, it's a perfect photograph. When you look at a photograph, one of the measures is, is it a subject of importance? Well, this clearly was. And now, is it technically a well-framed photograph? Now, a well-framed photograph, and this is not the only way you determine it, is you draw a line from here to here and from here to here. And the essence of that photograph should be right there. And right there is the essence of this photograph. In her hand, is the sum of all her concerns. She isn't looking at the photographer, she's looking beyond the photographer. She's looking to a world that maybe could be better for her. Mm -hmm. We went to Carol and I went to see the American Museum, American Indian Museum in Washington. And they had this enormous photograph or thing of, you know, the famous American cigar, Indian holding a cigar? Well, he had blown that up bigger than this. And he made the whole thing by gluing Indian head nickels, thousands of them. He painted them, and then he would glue, boop, 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 boop. So when you stood close to it, all you saw these nickels. But when you got away from it, you could see only the picture. So it's very clever. He's got a great imagination. This is a very iconic image by a, by a, a photographer, Serrano. I put it there because here is America's sweetheart. She happens to be Hispanic. You don't rarely see a Hispanic girl being selected as America's sweetheart. Yeah. And that's a very significant thing happening in this country.
This is uh, uh, actually a gallery photographer in Africa. And in Africa, it's very important to have your picture taken if you're a family. And it's very important you have to be taken looking affluent. Mm -hmm. He charges $5 for a photograph. And people wait months and months and months. And when they, what they do is they end up making a back cloth. They take a piece of material. You see there's dirt. It's just done on the street. And then they, they kind of decorate themselves to look beautiful mm -hmm. with jewelry, necklaces of all kinds. And they dress up in their Sunday best or whatever mm -hmm. their best is they have because they want to be memorialized, not in the poverty, poverty that they live in. But This particular image is very hard to see, but it's uh, a mo done last year by Hiroshima Shugimoto, uh, a extremely um, uh, popular and uh, important contemporary photographer. And what he did is he decided to go back to photography his roots, and he found out that he could in fact acquire unprinted Fox Talbot uh, uh, negatives for four hundred and five hundred thousand dollars each, uh, and these were negatives that Fox Talbot was a Fox Talbot was a creator of photography, at least according to the English. The French would claim otherwise, but the English claim that photography be began in a place called Leacock Abbey uh, in the Cockwalls outside, you know, west of London. Um, in a very modest place, and we went to visit it once, and uh, it was surprisingly modest for what it did. Uh, a scientist, uh, Fox Talbot, had gone to, on vacation in Italy, and um, he noticed that his son got, when he was in the sun, his, the sun changed the color of his, uh, uh, of his hand, and that it, his watch, uh, when he took his watch off, there was, a, there was no sunburn, so it changed. He said, you know, maybe light, Maybe light can be used, maybe sun can be used to make an image or change an image. Because he had tried to be an artist and he was failed at it. So he went back into his garage and started experimenting with things. How to get the sun to hit a mirror, to hit a piece of paper. And how to make that uh, reflection remain on, on that paper. And they tried all different kinds of things. Once they took uh, egg, egg yellows. I think it was egg yellows, albumin, it's either egg whites or, I always forget, egg whites or egg yellows. And they spread that on this kind of uh, sensitized paper. And as the light hit it, the light would create an image. It actually create like a shadow. It was called shadow drawing or sun drawing. And this was one of his very, we think this might be the very first image that contained a child. Um, in fact, it contained four children. It's called Seven at Leacock Abbey. And you've got some, whoops, uh, you've got uh, somewhere in here. One, two, three, four children and three adults. Uh, he then developed these, had them framed and led for reasons I'm not quite sure why, but when you buy this photograph, uh, you have to buy it in this lid, which makes it extremely heavy, which I found out when I tried to hang it on the wall. It took three of us, four of us actually, to lift it up. And he, I like it, again, not only because it's an interpretive photograph, a unique 21st century photograph, but it goes back to the beginnings of drawing with light and photography. And so I, I put this as one of the last images along with this, because this is the photo opposite of that. This is the most recent photograph uh, taken by the most important photographer living today, Thomas Struth. Thomas Struth uh, did a series called the Museum Series, where he went to museums, spent hours in there, watching people's reaction to art. His theory had been that when a great painting, this is Velasquez in this painting here, uh, in the Prado, when 
a painting finds its way in a museum, it actually is being buried. It's lost its vibrancy. But when you put people in the museum and have the people interact with the, the great work of art, art kind of comes back to life. So what he did is he created another piece of art by photographing, in this case, school children, uh, listening to their teacher who's sitting right over there. And she is talking about this particular, this is a, uh, a surrender of the Spanish and the Belgians in some battle somewhere. <laughs> somewhere. Um, but it's a very beautifully composed photograph. You see that if you look carefully and you go see it on the wall, a lot of these children are taking positions that are very similar to the soldiers. Now, he's not staging them like Crutzen would do. He's off in the corner trying to be uh, unnoticed. He might spend seven, eight, ten hours in a museum to make this one photograph. And I felt that this photograph uh, was, a, was a photograph on which I could end my show, and, because I think in many respects it captures, if you look at every one of, you know, if you carefully view all of these children, every emotion of children is found somewhere amongst these. There are those that actually are listening to the teacher, and most are not. Uh, ones that are fooling around, ones that seem to be off in space. Uh, but whatever they're doing, this is a wonderful photograph because it is, again, the essence of what I call uh, the grace that you find in children. And now if you put the lights on and I can hear anybody, I'll answer any questions you have. Thank you.